yeah so the recording has started for today's class uh, so every class we will record the lectures like this and uh, and in case uh, any day i forget to start recording uh, please remind me to do that that will it will be for your own benefit and uh, all the recorded lectures as well as the notes and slides will be made available after every class so you uh, like even if your uh, like internet connectivity is not that great and you miss out certain parts of the lecture during the lecture hours you don't have to worry about that so i will be the main instructor for this class i am adhoy mitra from the center of excellence in artificial intelligence and this is my email id so you may communicate with me using this email id apart from this uh, the we will have an adjunct faculty professor arup kanguli he is from northeastern university in usa he is like a renowned uh, scientist in this field he, like he works mostly in the areas of sustainable data science uh, he is a civil engineer by training but he has been working a lot in the domains of uh, hydrology and climate and, and along with the applications uh, of machine learning to these fields so apart from that these uh, we will also have guest lectures by uh, faculty members on certain specific topics like for example when we talk about say indian monsoon while talking about in the climate module then we will get some uh, experts on indian monsoon to talk about it or when we are talking about uh, say remote sensing we may get some remote sensing experts to talk about uh, their their problems and so on so uh, so this is a like an innovative course this is one of the uh, very first times such a uh, subject is being offered and uh, definitely in india and it's quite rare uh, in like even uh, worldwide also so this is the second time we are offering this subject the first time it was offered was last year it uh, like uh, so last year what we did is that we followed the same guidelines we had the same uh, uh, these guest lectures also uh, the thing that is going to be different this time compared to last time is the evaluation pattern because unlike last time we there will be no uh, mid sem or end sem exams like like that because uh, because of the online semester instead what we are going to do is we will have some four to five quizzes uh, with these quizzes will there will be like once or twice per month maybe in the first two months namely january and february there may be up to two quizzes per month later it, we will ease it out in march and uh, april when you will have uh, the other things to do uh, there will be one single short test about of one hour duration uh, that will be of 25% of the weightage it will be held in the later part of february so it's roughly the equivalent of a mid sem exam and then we will have a one student seminar it is the these two components which are going to be the most important parts of this subject we will have a seminar and one mini project so so every in the seminar uh, everyone will be expected to uh, like record a video of when they will talk say 15 to 20 minutes about one uh, topic either uh, a topic of their own interest related to this domain or choose from a list of topics which will be provided by us uh, by us means by myself and professor arup ganguli and then there will be one mini project also the in the mini project the students will have to form groups of 3 uh, to 4 people and work on a certain a small problem where they, we had, which will definitely involve collecting some data sets and running Uh, one or two uh, machine learning uh, algorithms on them to solve uh, uh, like one particular question uh, so again we, in this case also we will give them a list of uh, uh, we will like we will give you a list of uh, topics possible project topics from which you may choose or if you yourself want to uh, like uh, uh, propose your own project topic and work on it that is also perfectly fine with us so uh, the 25% of the credit will come from this short test another 25% will come from the student seminar so that's total 50% now the remaining 50% will be split between the quiz and the projects so uh, the exact nature of the 
split, we may keep it flexible. Uh, so there will be at least 10% from the quizzes and uh, uh, at least 30% from the projects. But if someone has not done well in the quizzes but has done the project well or vice versa, we may adjust their uh, the weightages to their benefit. But this 25% from the test and 25% from the seminar are fixed. And everyone will have to give the seminar and everyone will also have to participate in the uh, project though the project will be in the form of a, it, it will be basically be a team project of four to five people each. At the end of the project, you will be expected to submit a report and also give a Viva Vose examination. Okay, so the reason for having the Viva Vose examination is just to make sure that all, all members of the team contribute properly and it's not that one person does the entire project and the other three just uh, piggyback on him or her, that should not happen. So that's why we we'll need to have a Viva Vose examination. And as I already said, the for, for seminars and projects, we will uh, provide you a list of topics uh, in, uh, to which you will you are free to add by yourself. And uh, regarding the background, uh, so because this is going to be a course of, of like it's uh, the name of the course is machine learning. Uh, for art system sciences. So the students are expected to have at least a working knowledge of machine learning and deep learning. Uh, this will not be needed in the first two months, uh, but uh, like when we uh, go to the case studies where we will actually pick up certain research papers and discuss them and, uh, and uh, that is try to understand uh, what has been done in those papers. There we may like it, it will be necessary to have a background of machine learning and deep learning to understand those papers. You need not be an expert in these subjects, but at least a working knowledge is important. Uh, similarly, you also need to be comfortable with probability and statistics and linear algebra. This is more to do with the first part of the subject where we will be studying spatiotemporal statistics and spatiotemporal data mining. And additionally, there should be a general interest on each of the uh, or, or at least one of these uh, following topics uh, because we are going to study the applications of machine learning in uh, in these domains. Uh, so all of you will not obviously not know all these domains properly, uh, but at least uh, in one of the domains, uh, even if you have not studied uh, formally, you should have a general interest. Otherwise, you may not find this course interesting. Okay. And uh, so here is a general timeline of the class. So you, you, like in the initial uh, two or three lectures, uh, we will do a brief recapitulation of the pro of probabilistic modeling of parameter estimations and uh, like relevant concepts of machine learning. Uh, so this is just going to serve as some kind of a refresher for uh, uh, for those of you who have not been in touch with these subjects of late or may have some of you may not even have you may not know some of these topics. Uh, then we will come to spatial and temporal statistics. You can say this will cover the month of January. Then in the month of February, we will do a spatial and temporal data mining. And then uh, we will have a brief primer or maybe another two lectures for deep learning for our, uh, for our sciences. So we will basically uh, do a very brief recapitulation of uh, various deep learning models, not in great details, but only in as much detail as necessary to understand the papers which we will come up in the months of March and April. So in March and April, we will now go into the specific domains. Uh, in each domain, we will uh, stop for say uh, three weeks or so. And we will in uh, during those weeks, we will pick, we will pick up some three to four papers and try to uh, understand what are the problems uh, addressed in those papers. Actually, uh, actually, first of all, uh, when we whenever we start any particular topic, we will first have an introductory lecture, a guest lecture by some faculty uh, of the concerned subject, who will first tell us uh, uh, or be, uh, give us a big brief background about what are the important problems in those uh, in those areas where machine learning can be of some useful, right? And after that, we will pick up some uh, three to four papers uh, uh, from the same domain where machine learning has been used for uh, some of the problems mentioned by the expert faculty earlier. 
and we will try to understand uh, like how the problem uh, like how, how those papers try to solve those problems and uh, based on these papers some of you may get some ideas related to your project and seminar topics so uh, it is also expected that all of you will finalize your uh, project topics say by the end of may uh, sorry by the end of february but if you are not able to do so uh, like you can take it up to middle of march also but uh, the sooner you are able to finalize the project topic and start working on it the more time you will get to finish it so it will be uh, in your interest to start thinking about uh, a possible project topic those of you who are who already have some idea are uh, most welcome to uh, uh, just propose your own project topics. Of course, it should be discussed with me before you start working on it. Uh, and for those who may not have had much of a background in these in, in art sciences, who may not be particular or may not be aware of any particular project topic. So for them, we will, as I said, we will be providing a list of uh, possible projects from which you may choose. Okay, so this is the general outline of the class uh, and uh, so before i move on to uh, to the to more technical aspects uh, if you have any questions you can ask me now and, and another thing is that uh, i also want to get an understanding of uh, what what kind of background you have in the various prerequisites for the subject say machine learning probability and so on uh, so for that a link to a google form has been given uh, like it is posted outside this uh, this uh, meeting in the uh, in the timeline of the of this particular uh, ms teams i will give it again uh, in the chat box please fill up that form in full details so that i can uh, like i get an understanding of uh, how long i should continue this uh, the the refresher course uh, i mean the, the refresher lectures which i just mentioned uh, like uh, like should i do it finish it off in one lecture or should i take two to three lectures it all depends on that okay. so here i am just giving you once again the link to the google form please fill it up okay uh, so if anyone has any questions regarding this subject, please uh, you can unmute yourself and ask one by one. You can first please raise your hand and uh, I will call accordingly. Yeah, Yuvraj Kumar. What's your query? Yes, sir. sir. Can you explain about the seminar, sir? So in the seminar, we will uh, the, the in the in case of the seminar, we will be basically expected to explain uh, either one particular topic which has not been covered in class, uh, maybe a slightly advanced topic, or you will be ex expected to uh, like discuss a research paper. So for uh, like a list of topics and a list of papers we will provide uh, like you can choose from one of them and or you can uh, uh, like choose your own topic or your own paper. The seminar will have to be say about 20 minutes long like uh, you, you need to prepare slides and you need to uh, give a record a presentation along with a voiceover that is the slides as well as uh, along with a voiceover. Uh, and upload the, the that video, the recorded video on YouTube for evaluation. OK, thank you, sir. Any other question? OK, if there are no further questions, uh, let, let's start uh, with uh, the introductory lecture we will not take i will not take much long today because i understand that many of the students have uh, who have signed up for this class have not yet joined on this team so i do not want them to miss the first class so i will 
uh, like I will just uh, give a short introduction about what kind of problems we will be studying in this uh, in this subject, and then uh, the technicals will start going in from the next class, which is tomorrow. So let's continue with this. Mm. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, so most of the, the problems which we will encounter in this class are related to spatiotemporal modeling and spatiotemporal data mining. That is to say the kind of data uh, which we will be handling in this class, can, like the, those data can be from various domains of art science, they can, like from hydrology, from climate, uh, from geology, maybe from seismology, whatever. Uh, different kinds of data we may come across, but all the uh, data will have this characteristic that they are going to be spatiotemporal in nature. What do I mean by spatiotemporal data? So, spatio, as the name suggests, each data point will have a spatial index attached to it as well as a temporal index attached to it. That is in case of normal machine learning, say in case of the image classification problem, we have a large number of images which we need to classify that this is the image of a dog, this is the image of an aeroplane, this is the image of a tree and so on. So we may have some 10,000 images like this which we need to classify. Now the if you consider any one of those images, uh, like each image has something like an ID number, say 1, 2, 3, 4 or whatever it is in the serial number. But those ID numbers don't really carry any uh, extra information. The data which we are having or each which is the each image, it's it, it, like it's a uh, like it, 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 it's an image by itself. When that image was clicked or where that image was clicked, etc. These attributes do not really have much uh, importance when we are trying to solve the object classification problem. But in this case, in the case of spatiotemporal data, uh, the uh, when we are dealing with data points or observations, it is very Im important to uh, know uh, where exactly that observation has been recorded and at what time, because the reason for that is uh, the these kinds of observations, uh, like uh, they are actually. Uh, that is they are dependent on the location as well as dependent on the time. Like if I am make, making an observation in one location and if I am making the observation of the same variable in a different location, their results may be significantly different. Say for example, if I am measuring the temperature in uh, Sahara Desert and I am measuring the temperature in Antarctica, obviously there is going to be a huge difference in the temperature. Again, if I am measuring the temperature at two at two, any two places which are say 10 kilometers apart and it also, again we are measuring the temperatures of two places which are say 500 kilometers apart or 5000 kilometers apart. So we can say that uh, the, the temperature in the two places in the first case which are 10 kilometers apart, their temperatures is likely to be pretty much the same, they, it, it, almost identical. But if we consider the uh, temperature at the two places which are say 5000 kilometers apart, the, the temperatures may be completely unrelated. Uh, it's possible that one will, one place is very hot, the other place is very cold, or one place is uh, medium, the other place is also medium. It can be anything. Basically, uh, uh, they uh, that is, uh, they are so far apart that there is there may not be any particular connection between those two places, right? So uh, again, as far as time is concerned, then also the same thing is true. So if I am suppose I am measuring the temperature at any place at 12 noon and I am measuring the same the temperature at the same place at 2 a.m. that is 2 o'clock at night. So we can uh, like even if we know about nothing else about that place we can confidently say that the temperature at 12 noon is definitely going to be uh, significantly higher than the temperature at 2 am. So, uh, so uh, here uh, that as uh, like as I said that uh, the time that, that or the temporal aspect of the data becomes important. Again, uh, like if there is a uh, any particular variable 
once again let us say temperature if we are measuring it at a uh, two short intervals of time let's say at 10 am and 10 30 am uh, like it's expected that the temperature will be more or less the same there will there may not be too much of a difference between 10 am and 10 30 am but if it is say uh, one measurement is done at 8 am another measurement is done at say 5 pm uh, like like there may or may not be any significant difference, but uh, like they are too far apart and we can uh, like they can we can say that these two temperatures are essentially independent of each other. Right? Now, so in these in the kind of problems which we will be dealing with in this throughout this class, we, we will see a definite pattern to the these problems. So, so here what I am today, what I, I will try to do is like introduce some template problems uh, and more, and you will find that most of the problems in this class, which we will deal with in this class, especially in the later parts of this class as some kind of some some versions of these problems only. So let uh, so here is the what the template looks like. So let us first begin with some notations. So let us say that there is a region the region may be uh, it, in any geographical zone it can be uh, as, as small as say a river valley or it can be uh, like a medium like say like a country or it can be as large as say even a continent and so on but, but let us say that there is a region which we are which is our study region and within that region there are capital s number of locations so what do I mean by locations? A location is like basically any place which can be referenced by a latitude longitude coordinates. Right? So for example, we know that every point in the on the surface of the earth, it has its own latitude and longitude. But uh, for our benefit, we do not uh, consider each and every point in on the earth surface separately because that will be uh, like too much to handle or uh, like it will basically be infinite amount of data. So what we do is we uh, like build some kind of a grid system, right? Uh, and uh, the grids may be of uh, uh, like uh, say, uh, let me just draw this thing. So uh, we all know that uh, say this is the art surface and we divide uh, like along the art surface we draw these kinds of latitudes which are basically parallel lines or uh, yeah, like this uh, and then we draw longitudes like this right of course latitudes are all like I, although i have drawn uh, like only as uh, like uh, these lines at certain intervals from each other but actually it's not like that latitudes and longitudes are bo both continuous things that is even if i cons uh, consider a point like this which does not lie on any of these lines uh, still it will have a latitude and longitude values but as i said to simplify our task let us deal with only those latitudes and those longitudes which have say integer values. So maybe this is say uh, 40 degree north. This is uh, 30 degree north. This is 20 degree north and so on. And similarly, these uh, uh, longitudes, maybe this is say 60 degree east. This is 70 degree east. This is 80 degree east and so on. Now, let us consider, consider this part, uh, uh, one particular uh, block like this. Okay, let me highlight it like this. Okay, this is uh, one particular block on the uh, earth surface. So it's uh, this uh, edge of the block, let's say is 60 degree east longitude and this edge is 61 degree east longitude. So basically this uh, this uh, width of this box is one degree longitude. Similarly, let us say uh, this uh, like this bottom line and this top line. Let's, uh, let's say that this bottom line is say the 30 degree north latitude and this one is the 31 degree north latitude so uh, this side uh, the this height of this 
rectangular shape is basically 1 degree lat. So we can say that this box, this is the 1 degree by 1 degree rectangle. On the like I, I may not call it the square because this side and this side may not be equal, but like both of them are 1 degree. One, This is 1 degree latitude, this is 1 degree longitude. And uh, the whole art surface is uh, like we can divide it into one degree by one degree boxes like this with the help of the latitudes and the longitudes. And for, it need not be one degree by one degree. If I want, I can choose bigger boxes also. Say if I choose this box, this box itself. So what is its size? This is uh, 10 degree longitudes and this one is 10 degree latitudes. So from 40, uh, 40 to 30, this is a degree north latitudes, that's 10 degree. And this is between 70 to 80 degree east longitudes, which is also 10 degree. So this whole uh, box is a 10 degree by 10 degree box. So this small box on the other hand is 1 degree by 1 degree box. So, uh, so whether we go for 1 degree boxes or 10 degree boxes is a different question that simply depends on uh, our uh, like our convenience. But the important thing is that instead of dealing with individual points like this on the earth surface, we are going to uh, like consider uh, these kinds of boxes which will have certain uh, lat like which will be enclosed by certain latitudes and longitudes. And we may in uh, uh, like represent each of the these boxes by uh, uh, like either it's say uh, top corner or it's bottom corner or it's central corner and so on that is uh, that is although this is a one degree by one degree box we can like uh, we may refer to this as the say the uh, 60 degree east from a 30 degree north box by refer when we are saying that we are basically referring to this corner this uh, the uh, bottom left corner of the box Similarly, I, if I want, I may refer to uh, like refer to the uh, box as by its top left corner or its bottom right corner or its center as well. So, uh, so that uh, basically I was saying all this to elaborate on the word uh, locations. So whenever I am talking about locations in this class, you will have to understand that I am talking about this kind of, uh, of a box which has like which which can be referenced by one latitude and a longitude. Okay. So the uh, so we can say that the, the region which we are considering it has s number of locations or s number of boxes like this. Now uh, one particular geophysical measure variable is being measured at every location. Let's consider call that geophysical variable as x. So this x can be, let's say, the temperature. It can be the precipitation. It can be humidity. It can be, uh, say, uh, uh, if we are dealing with uh, oceans, then it can be the salinity, uh, or it can be the, say, the uh, maybe the uh, depth of uh, uh, like if we are de dealing with ocean floors once again we it might be the depth of the ocean floor uh, or it may be something like the amount of arsenic in content in the water below that level or it can be anything any kind of geophysical variable uh, that we are measuring at the uh, at these locations so once again when we are uh, like as i already said by location we mean these boxes. So if when we are dealing with uh, a geophysical variable, they obviously it, its value might vary from one point of the box to another point of the box. Say even within this, this small box, if I am considering this point and this point, the geophysical variable X, which we are considering may have some different values. But uh, I will refer, to, but when I am referring to the uh, value of x uh, we, at this location, what I mean is the average of, the, uh, like I, what I actually mean is that uh, we can measure the temperature at very like tiny, tiny points inside and take its average. 
or I can somehow choose a representative location somewhere within the box and take only one value and just pretend that that uh, that single value which we have taken is somehow representative of the whole box, which may not be the a very accurate thing to do, but it is the efficient thing to do because we cannot deal with each and every point. So we have to make, like uh, re like re reduce the point space and uh, make it uh, and deal with boxes instead of points. Yeah. Now see, just like the this geophysical variable X is being measured at different locations, it is also being measured at different times and at regular time intervals. So these time intervals, it, it may be hourly, say for example, I may be taking hourly temperature readings from a thermometer at a given location, or it may be daily also, like it may, it, it may happen that at every day at a particular time, I am taking a reading of the temperature, maybe on every day at 12 noon, I take the, I, I like I measured the temperature and call that as, as today's temperature. Of course, again, just like, uh, like within one of those boxes, the temperature may vary. Similarly, within every hour or within every day also, the uh, temperature may vary. Uh, so like it is not possible to keep track of all the variations. So like in either of the cases, we, we can do two things. One is that we can uh, take only take the value uh, uh, at measure the value at only one particular location or only one particular cooler uh, uh, time point and say that that uh, that these represent the uh, readings for the whole location or I mean for the for the whole box or for the whole day or for whole hour and so on. Or alternatively, I can take the measurements at multiple location uh, at multiple points or multiple uh, hours uh, and more multiple uh, times in the within the same day or within the same hour, etc. Take an average of that and uh, uh, and uh, take that use that average as, as the reading. Uh, but either way, basically for every location and every uh, time point or every time step we will we are going to have one value of that variable now uh, like uh, say uh, we can uh, like denote the, this reading in the following way so x is the name of the variable uh, it indicates what kind of variable we are measuring is it temperature or is it humidity or is it something else so first we will write x which is basically the name of the variable then superscript will be s the s meaning the location that is uh, the superscript of this variable will tell you at what location you are making the measurements and then in the subscript it will be the time index now the time index may be uh, or even the space, uh, space index also potentially but not always but definitely the time index like it can be written in multiple ways because time keeps on repeating, right? So, uh, like every like if we are talking about measuring the twelve o'clock the temperature at say twelve noon or measuring the temperature at four p.m. and so on. Now every day there to twelve p.m. comes. Every day four p.m. comes. So these the uh, these the hours are like keep on repeating. So. Uh, we have to also it is not enough to measure the to mention the hour when we like we also have to mention the day which date and which hour and which location that is the that uh, like gives you the entire information about the particular reading which we have got that 30 that is it, it uh, if you are saying that the temperature is 31 degree celsius uh, we will have to basically say the complete information will be that uh, the temperature at Kharagpur on uh, say 4th January at 3 p.m. is 30, uh, sorry 4th January 2021 uh, at 3 p.m. is 31 degree Celsius. Like the, the the all the information will have to be all the special as well as temperature tempo, temporal information will have to be mentioned along with the variable. Otherwise, the uh, the data will not be complete. Or uh, so the but the, this kind of data need not be hourly. Also, it may also be daily. 
से व्हाट इज द टेम्परेचर एट और व्हाट इज द एवरेज टेम्परेचर इन आईआईटी खड़गपुर एट लाइक से इन ऑन ऑन द फर्स्ट डे ऑफ द मंथ नॉट राइट now first day of which month is it january is it february is it may or and, and so on so uh, like it is like in this case it is not enough to just mention which day you also have to say which month and then again the months also keep on repeating uh, like uh, every month we have like within every month the dates repeat within in every year the months repeat so the for the complete in, like if you are looking going for daily data you will first have to specify the year then you have to specify the month and then only you have to specify the day and of course you have to specify the location also right so the the note the uh, convention we will follow in this class is that we will use the location information in the superscript and the temporal information in the subscript and when we are uh, like dealing with the temp temporal information we will uh, like resolve the the time point uh, as much as necessary for that particular problem so if we are dealing with daily data that is the smallest temporal scale or the finest temporal scale of the data is daily then we we, we do not need to include hours in the subscript we can only we, we can deal with only year month and a date uh, or we may even uh, like uh, drop the months if necessary and we can just consider every year has like 365 days so we can say the say the 55th day of the year on or the 231st day of the year and so on but the year of course we will have to uh, like quantify as yes, whether i am which year i am talking about is it 1951 or is it 2005 or is it 2074 or or what right so this is how, like how we are going to denote our uh, uh, denote and uh, index the uh, spatio temporal data in this class okay now uh, the observations which we are talking about the uh, like so these observations where will they come from these observations can come from various uh, sensors various kinds of sensors which uh, read or which record the kind of uh, the kind of uh, geophysical variable which we are interested in so if we are interested in temperature then we need a thermometer if we are need uh, if we want to measure the pressure then we need a barometer if we want to measure the rainfall we need a rain gauge or an automatic weather station or something like that similarly if i want to measure the wind speed there are devices for doing that if i want to measure the salinity of the ocean there again there are other devices for doing that so basically these are there are sensors which have to be deployed at the correct at the uh, or at the required place at the required time and we have to get the measurements from that but then again the observations are available at only a subset of all the locations because we cannot deploy we cannot give on uh, or go about deploying sensors everywhere or thus nor can we expect the sensors to be working all the time there i mean there are sensors which uh, like which now work around the clock and there are uh, technologies of uh, which enable us to uh, uh, that is spread out <laughs> sensing uh, sensing devices uh, like to almost every place in the world but still we uh, we can expect that uh, the uh, the sensing sensing technology which we have do cannot cover every single location and every single time point the observations are available only at a uh, subset of the locations and using these we somehow have have to make estimations about the same variable at the other places where the sensors are not available so now if you want to visualize this whole matter so let us uh, let, let us look at this figure so this is like a spatio temporal diagram let us first forget the temporal part and look only at the spatial part so let's say that this is the uh, region which i am studying so it as i said this region can be quite small like a re river valley or it can be medium like say a country or a state or it can be quite large like say a whole like a continent or a whole ocean and so on so 
just like i was talking about those boxes so let us say that we have these locations that is the whole area of the region we have somehow divided into this uh, into a certain number of locations let us say s now uh, some locations may not be of any use to me uh, let, let's say those are the say the barren regions or the, the barren grasslands or water where no one lives anyway so uh, we are not really interested in uh, making any observe uh, like in actually observing or estimating the uh, values at those locations uh, let us say that these 15 are the locations which we are interested in where we actually want to make the measurements so uh, th there are you can see that there are some locations in blue and some locations in orange so we can assume that the blue locations are the ones where uh, our measurements are available and the orange locations are the ones where measurements are not available right because uh, like just i said said earlier the um, sensing technology may not be available in all these places okay so so uh, it may happen that the uh, locations which we are considering they may be uh, like they, they they may not be equidistant from each other there may be some locations which are close to each other there may be some locations which are far apart from each other like these three locations you can see are reasonably close to each other but they are further apart from uh, there is a clear difference between these locations and uh, the other locations similarly this s7 this seems more like an isolated location while s8 s9 s10 these seem again seem to be close to each other so uh, and and gen then generally we know that if two locations are close to each other then the, the then it we may expect that the values of the uh, various geophysical variables at any given point of time may be quite similar in those locations so that is something which is sometimes called the first law of geography it, it's like saying that uh, like if we have two nearby places they are the uh, geo geophysical variables at those two places are likely to be nearly equal this need not always be the case because uh, like it, it's possible that uh, there is a steep mountain range where, and, and these two locations uh, let's say s8 and s9 the one of them lies on the plain and the other one lies on the top of the mountain that can happen only if the the mountain is very steep but there are examples of, of that and it, it, so in principle it is possible that despite being close uh, they are uh, actually their temper the temperatures between them are significantly different that is also possible but in general we can expect in most normal situations that uh, if two locations are close to each other then the geophysical variables uh, at, at those two locations are likely to be uh, nearly equal so now this kind of uh, data we can have on any given time point let's say t equal to 3 and then uh, the same kind of information we will have at other time points also say t equal to 2 and t equal to 1 and so on so like so when i am talking about uh, this particular reading what I mean is the value at location number 12 at t equal to 3 or when I am talking about this uh, what I actually mean is I want the reading or the uh, value of the geophysical variable at location number 8 at t equal to 2 and so on. So uh, like this is the, like uh, the geophysical data the spatiotemporal data which we are talking about this is how we can uh, visualize it like uh, in, in a, it's like a 3D structure we, like the space is uh, two dimensional I mean space is actually three dimensional because we should ideally include the orography the height or uh, height altitude of the locations also but let us say that we are considering space as two dimensional we are dealing only with latitudes and longitudes and along with it we have to consider the time dimension also now uh, so here are some of the template problems which might arise in this case so first of all estimate the uh, values of x at those locations which have no observations 
so as i already said that uh, observations are available only in the blue locations but not in the orange locations so uh, so suppose you know the observe the value of the of a variable let us say uh, the wind speed let's say you know the wind speed at all of these locations then using that you will have to predict the wind speed at these locations where we do not have the data so uh, so that is one kind of problems they, they, like we can call this as the special interpolation or special extrapolation problem and next second time is uh, the predict the future values of x at all the locations so uh, like at the like you you know the values of t equal to 1 t equal to 2 t equal to 3 at all these blue locations now predict what is the going to be the uh, value of the of the variable x at location s5 at t equal to 5 or what is going to be the uh, value of the uh, of the variable at the location s8 at t equal to 4 so these are uh, like uh, having observed the data up till a point we have to predict the future data that is the another kind of prediction or task which can be called as the forecasting problem so the first one i said uh, is the interpolation problem the second one is the forecasting problem right the the uh, third one is Uh, not really different from the others in fact it might help you to solve the first problem identify the special relationships between locations so uh, like uh, if like can we say that uh, or can we build some kind of rules that say the temperature uh, at s2 always lies somewhere in between the temperature s1 and s3 right that can happen when in in very in certain situations that can happen like if for example if like s1 is uh, is at the foothills of a particular mountain s3 is at the top of the parting of that mountain and s2 is uh, somewhere in the middle is all, like is a town built uh, like along the sides of uh, or along the slopes of the mountain right so in that case we can expect like with a reasonable degree of confidence that the temperature in s2 will be between in between the temperatures at s1 and s3 or there may be some relationship or or some situations where if uh, uh, like uh, it may happen that uh, we are dealing with rainfall for example now let us say uh, like as uh, as it happens in many parts of the world including in india say the rainfall is caused by certain rain bearing clouds which are coming in from one particular directions so when it's uh, like when the those cloud maybe the clouds come in like this Uh, when the clouds first enter here then they cause heavy rainfall in these regions then uh, at that time these regions say s4 s5 they remain dry then the uh, those clouds gradually move northward and then reach this s4 s5 so by uh, and then causes heavy rainfall there but at that time these s9 s10 this region again remains dry and then uh, again after some time they uh, after giving rainfall to s4 and s5 that those clouds either uh, they they finish off their water content or they move in some other direction and then uh, again another round of clouds coming from this direction propagate this way cause uh, like rainfall and then again disappear so in this case it's like saying that uh, s9 s10 they get rainfall simultaneously but their rainfall is in opposite phase with s4 s5 that is when s9 s10 get the rainfall then s4 s5 doesn't and when s4 s5 get the rainfall then s9 s10 don't right so uh, these kinds of special relationships can also exist and then there can be identify trends or periodic or seasonal behavior so we know that many uh, geophysical variables uh, are like they are not constant throughout the year in fact they uh, they show variations according to certain tendencies those tendencies may be long term or short term say for example if we are considering the rainfall over india or, or at any place in india let's say kharagpur we will say or see very less rainfall uh, 
uh, in the early months, say January, February and so on. Then from around the time of April and May, we will start seeing a gradual rise in the rainfall. Right? And then uh, by the end of June, it will have significantly increased in at July and August, it may be at the peak and then it will start declining. And finally, maybe uh, right and uh, then after September, it will uh, rapidly fall off. Maybe in October, there may be some amount of rain. And then again, the winter season begins and the uh, rainfall almost disappears. So this we can say is something like a plot of the rainfall in uh, this location, which is Kharagpur. It may be true in many par other parts of India also, while there are some other plots in the Tamil Nadu region where the plot may look different. It may look somewhat like this. Say around uh, May there may be a spike, then in June, July, August, September it remains constant then around October November there is again a spike and then again it falls back. So this is like this is a structure which is observed every year. Once the year ends then we will see once again the same structure repeating in the next year again the same structure repeating in the next year and so on right. So we can say that this is something like a periodic structure in the data. And uh, so the, this kind of periodic structure is something which we may be interested in trying to identify from the uh, data which we have got. It may not always be such an easy thing like uh, uh, like if we, we if we can plot the time series of the data, we, we in some cases be able to identify the this kind of periodic behavior right away. In other cases, the periodic behavior may be much more subtle and we may not be able to find it that easily. Then there is the question of long term trend. So this is particularly important uh, in the context of uh, climate change, which is uh, like an important uh, topic right now. And we and it will be an even more important topic in the future. So uh, Trend is like is a property of time series which basically indicates the long term behavior of the time series. So uh, I am sure many of you have seen time series data before earlier in any different context. So let us look at any uh, like a generic time series data without not any particular con application or any particular context. Let us say this is what an time series data. Okay, let's say this is what a time series data looks like. So, so first of all, one thing which will attract your attention is the periodic behavior. The value increases, like uh, increases, it reaches a particular uh, point and then keeps decreasing. It decreases up to a point again. It increases, uh, saturates, and then decreases, saturates, and so on. So, this first of all, like he, uh, like by focusing on this, you can understand the periodic behavior of the time series data what I also explained earlier. Uh, apart from the periodic data, you can observe one more thing. The thing is that uh, from here till here, it's like the, uh, there is a general upward trend. And then after this upward trend, we may see it has kind of stabilized. There is uh, like the peaks were earlier, that is from one peak to another, we were seeing an increase. That is, uh, he, this is also a peak, this is also a peak, but this peak is higher than this peak. Similarly, this is a, this peak is higher than the peak, peak, and this peak is higher than the, the previous peak and so on. So the, like the peaks were increasing gradually. After that, the peaks may stagnate, like this peak, this peak, they may be at almost at near equal levels. So this is like this kind of thing is known as the, uh, the trend the long term independent the long term component of the data we say that from here to here the trend is upward and here from here to here the trend is flat and so on so the, so uh, so uh, like given the observations of any data or any kind of geophysical data we may be interested to understand 
like uh, how is this uh, this particular variable going to be affected by climate change uh, like as the world becomes a hotter and hotter place uh, we will we expect this to increase or do we expect this to decrease or to do something uh, like more complicated than just increase or decrease maybe uh, sometimes increase sometimes decrease or maybe it's uh, like it, the periods will become uh, irregular or maybe the these amplitudes will become higher or maybe the amplitudes will become lower and so on so these are all questions which we may be interested in asking uh, in this case and the another question uh, or another type of questions which may frequently arise is the identification of anomalies or unusual events so look at this data this kind of time series data so here you can see that an unusual event happened here at this point what was the event the uh, like uh, the normal cycle of peaks and uh, troughs was continuing but we suddenly had a very high peak followed by a very deep trough deep trough right so uh, this particular uh, like we can say that during this particular period of time something unusual or anomalous happened in the observations this kind of thing need not be uh, in time but it may be in space also so it may happen that you are measuring the uh, temperature or uh, you are measuring the rainfall across uh, different parts of the country like the whole country is uh, having a serious drought there is very little uh, rainfall anywhere but there is one particular region a small river valley or a, uh, the uh, foothills of a particular mountain range which is receiving a very large amount of rainfall so such a thing we can say is an anomaly anomaly event is a special anomaly so similarly we can have a spatio temporal anomaly also we may, where we are uh, like where an unusual incident happens uh, or i mean the, the the geophysical variable which we are talking about that exhibit some unusual value for a small period of uh, time or for a limited period of time over a limited region that is called an anomaly event so identifying these kinds of anomaly events will is also another kind of problems which we will be interested in okay now uh, uh, so these are some of the, uh, the some of the template problems which we may be dealing with in this class now how do we go about solving these problems the key to solving these problems is the probabilistic method why probabilistic method because these kinds of data or these kinds of the kinds of problems the kinds of data everything has a lot of uncertainty measure involved in it what is the source of uncertainty uh, the first of all one is the uncertainty arising due to uh, the limitations of sensing the sensors which we use to measure the different uh, things may not always give us the right answers they are maybe the the sensors are all instruments which uh, are prone to error uh, so when the when your thermometer is saying 30 degree celsius that need not always be correct it may also be 29 or 31 degree celsius also it's possible that your temperature has some kind of a bias so uh, and uh, so now if you have one single thermometer of course you can carefully calibrate it and like you can keep on correcting its bias and so on but when we are uh, co collecting information from a, from thousands or millions of places across a large region then of course uh, handling each sensor individually is not possible like that so we have to assume that the uh, some of the, like each sensor has a certain probability of giving an erroneous result also so that is one set of uncertainty the other set of uncertainty arises uh, not from the sensing but from the system itself so the climate system or the earth science the earth system is itself a very complicated thing and it like it may involve lots of processes which are unpredictable so uh, there is this notion of chaos which some of you may have uh, heard about so uh, like a like a chaotic time series is such that uh, if you make a uh, like at at any given point if we the if the value changes by a small amount 
then after some time the like the value will have the, the actual value might have changed very significantly like let's say that uh, let us consider this kind of a data let's say the measurements were originally going like this now at a uh, particular point if somehow the value uh, becomes this instead of this let's say instead of x1 like the value is somehow is x2 then in the subsequent stages it the value may become uh, very different on uh, but if instead of like if it was x1 uh, it might have gone uh, like this so uh, it's almost like a railway track at a like a rail we know that a railway track has certain uh, junctions or points and uh, a, a point is a place where two railway tracks diverge and uh, like if you bend the track by just one inch like the train may move off by, by uh, move in a different direction away by many miles so these kinds of uh, like uh, like chaotic these kinds of things are quite common in chaotic phenomena and most many of the phenomena which we deal with in art sciences are actually chaotic phenomena like this that is uh, if if one thing changes early on, on in the in a season then the whole season may play out uh, in a very different way so these are things uh, which uh, like uh, uh, which uh, add to the unpredictability or the uncertainty of the systems and that is why we need the uh, the component of probability when we are, uh, are like studying these systems right so that is why whenever we are uh, deal or modeling these kinds of art systems we use probability theory as a very important tool and that's why i also said earlier that probability is a very important prerequisite for this subject for this class and uh, in the next couple of lectures we will actually be brushing up probability only so so whenever there are probabilities obviously there is going to be a random variable so we consider all the these x as the random variables so depending on uh, like what like uh, what kind of variables we define that is if it is like x sdh or x of s y m d like uh, depending on uh, what spatial resolutions you are using uh, or what temporal res resolutions you are using and so on but like all of these can be all of these x variables can be considered as random variables okay? now are, are all of them going to be separate random variables like uh, like are we going to say that the temperature at Kharagpur uh, on 4th January at uh, 3 p.m. is one random variable the temp the temperature at Kharagpur at 4th on 4th January 2021 at 4 p.m. is another random variable and so on like so do we go about uh, giving one separate random variables to each of the possible special spatiotemporal points uh, so by the way when i am talking about spatial point i am talking about location when i am talking about temporal point i am talking about uh, like uh, these kind of uh, indices uh, like uh, which which specifies both the day or the hour or which specifies the year month and day uh, and and so on uh, and when i mean when i say spatio temporal point it's a combination of both of them that is i will usually write s comma t uh, indicating a spatio temporal point s is the spatial location and t is the temporal location or temporal value so uh, so that's what i mean by spatio temporal point okay so uh, do i consider the very so like uh, as i said that like i can uh, i define this variable at every spatio temporal point and i can consider these variables as the random variables now does it mean that every the the variable at every spatio temporal point is going to be considered as a separate random variable 
that will not make much sense because uh, like uh, in that case if, if if all of them are different random variables then uh, how will you solve the problems so you, like uh, the, the kind of problems which we discussed earlier those can be solved only if we can assume that there is some kind of a some kind of a relationship uh, in space and time like let, let us say we are talking about the first problem that we mentioned that is given the, the uh, values at uh, the blue locations estimate the values at the orange locations now uh, if we consider that this is a random variable this is also a random variable this is also a random variable all of them are separate separate random variables and you, uh, we have to somehow estimate the value of the orange variables will we be able to do that of course we will not be able to do because we know that uh, s1 is one thing s2 s3 is another thing s2 is a uh, third thing like they are all separate things so even if we know the, the values of all the blue points we will not know anything additional about the orange points right so that will not help us to solve the problems we will be able to solve the problems only if we can somehow relate these orange points to the blue points or do something like that basically we have to somehow relate the uh, relate the different points or different variables to each other otherwise we will not be able to solve the problem so so we cannot consider or it is not useful to consider all the variable special like the the variables at all the spatio temporal points as separate random variables at the other extreme we can do one more thing we can consider that there is only one a random variable called temperature and the values which we are observing at different uh, locations and lo different time points they are simply realizations of the uh, random variable so it's like saying that i have a coin and i will carry out 1000 tosses and uh, like uh, but, but i will know that all of those 1000 tosses have been done with the same coin so the 1000 results which i will get the heads and the tails will all be basically related to this coin only uh, okay now again this uh, this also may not be uh, very useful physically like uh, as i was earlier saying there may be certain situations where uh, two physical variables are not related say uh, the te the temperature at kharagpur on uh, 6 pm uh, and uh, 6 pm and the temperature at uh, delhi at uh, say uh, on on the same day uh, maybe at 2 am so like obviously these two cannot be like while the first one will be something like maybe 15 degree 16 degree 18 degree the others may be say 1 degree 2 degree 3 degree uh, 5 or may even be 0 degree and so on and so it is not it may not make any physical sense to consider all of them as the uh, same random variables in in one case we are forcing everything to be separate in this case we are forcing everything to be same like the first one is uh, is uh, like physically it may be uh, it may make sense but it is not useful for most practical purposes the second one uh, like it is not uh, physically very meaningful so what the best option is to somehow divide the random or these variables into groups and say that all the values within the within one group are realizations of one of the same random variables that is it's like saying that like we have one, the results of 1000 tosses say heads tails heads tails let's say 600 heads i have got and 400 tails i have got got now i can either assume that there is only one coin which using which I did all the thousand tosses or I can imagine or I can say that there are thousand different coins and each coin was tossed once to get the corresponding uh, toss value right both of them are problematic if we think that there is that there are uh, thousand uh, different coins then we have to basically uh, deal with all the thousand points separately which is not useful as i said uh, on the other hand if we assume that all the uh, tosses have been done 
buy with the same coin then that is again as i said that may uh, may not be physically meaningful because not all the values are comparable so the best option might be uh, a trade off we may say that uh, there are 1000 tosses and there are say 10 coins and uh, say each of the coin was used to do maybe about 100 tosses and so on and so we can say that so it, it is enough for me to estimate the uh, parameters of only these uh, 10 coins and we can then uh, like try to understand which of the or like we can somehow uh, figure out which toss was done by which coin yeah so that is what i mean by uh, dividing the random variables into groups but then again how to define such groups so like we may de uh, define the uh, groups uh, i mean uh, define the groups of these variables in uh, various de ways depending on the nature of the problem say for example i may just say that uh, like uh, uh, that uh, let us say that the observations which we have are of this form x uh, s prefix i i'm sorry uh, superscript s uh, subscript dh means uh, the value of a particular variable let us say temperature at location s on day d on hour h it so this is the nature of the data let us let us say it may be something else also but uh, let's say that this is the nature of the data now i may say that x s h is the random variable that is uh, i need to define the random variable as the temperature at location s at Uh, at a particular hour of the day let's say at 2 pm and uh, so if we have observations of uh, of 2 pm from multiple days we can assume that those are basically instances from the of the same random variable that is the uh, the temperature at kharagpur at 3 pm i can measure it on 1st january i can measure it on 2nd january 3rd january 4th january 5th january 6th january 7th january and so on so uh, uh, but we can expect all these values to be roughly lying in the same range so like we can say that the uh, real thing the real uh, random variable is the uh, temperature at kharagpur at uh, 3 pm the date is kind of less important here uh, that and this value uh, and, and this particular quantity takes roughly comparable values uh, on the different days right? so that like basically in this case we are getting uh, so if this is how we define each group of uh, uh, like or if, if that is we uh, group the data to form our random variables then how many random variables i will get i will get 24s number of random variables why 24 because there are 24 hours in a day and for every hour i am defining one random variables so 24 the factor of 24 and why capital s because small s this is the uh, superscript this indicates the location now there are cap total capital s locations which i am uh, dealing with at each location i need a separate random variable so 24s now it might also happen that i find a way to divide these locations s also into a smaller number of groups let us say into three groups or four groups uh, maybe like uh, all the locations within the, these groups are close to each other so we decide to just club them together in that case so if we like if we can actually group these uh, to form uh, sub regions like this uh, then instead of uh, so that the total number of uh, separate sub the total number of location is capital s but the total number of sub regions may be uh, a smaller number say 20 so in that case the number of uh, total number of variables is going to be 24 into 20 okay and uh, similarly like if i instead of hourly data if uh, if you are interested in say uh, annual like data for every Uh, year month and day that is daily scale data so we can actually because uh, like uh, so, uh, so because the years uh, repeat it does not make sense to build uh, separate uh, variables for separate years on the uh, other hand uh, we can also uh, 
uh, we can we can also assume that within a single month the variable may not differ much significantly so we uh, there, there were three components in the time index uh, originally uh, we had the year we had the month and we had the day now we may uh, think that uh, like every year is going to repeat the month is going to repeat every year anyway so it does not uh, make sense to uh, in, in like keep year uh, to have a uh, random variable corresponding to the year so we drop the year when we are building the uh, random variable and we can also drop the day because we can like in certain situation or for certain kinds of variables uh, like we can expect that the uh, variable will uh, x will be more or less the same at on every day uh, within the same month say if we are dealing with january uh, with temperature then throughout january the there will not be too much difference say between uh, the temperature on 10th january and the temperature on 25th january uh, but uh, if we consider the month of March or May, then it will be quite different. So we re really do not need to uh, have separate subscripts or like we do not need to define separate random variables for each of the days. It is enough if we do it for the month. OK, so. Uh, so how exactly you can uh, club the different uh, observations together and define your random variables that is up to you depending on how much data you have depending on what is the nature of the problem uh, it is something which is uh, like there are no hard and fast rules like that but in general it makes sense to reduce the total number of uh, random variables in the system but it again uh, while you are reducing it you should not reduce it so much that a lot of the information gets lost that is also not a good idea somewhere you have to uh, strike a balance between how many random variables you need to define in your system okay and once you have defined the random variables then all the observations or the reading you have got you can treat them as instances of or realizations of those random variables now when we have like when we talk about random variables uh, then uh, the question arises so so what is the probability distribution assigned or uh, uh, like attached to those random variables what kind of random variables are they like or, or what or, or what are the probability distributions uh, like which those random variables follow uh, so far there are different types of probability distributions which uh, most of us have seen like say for example there can be binary distributions there can be gaussian distributions there might be chi square distributions there may be so many ki kinds of distributions so which distribution does my very my random variable follow right? so that that is the next question which will arise in probabilistic modeling so so first of all, the question is uh, what kind of uh, model of probability distribution should it have a continuous one or a discrete one? Then uh, if continuous, then we, what dis uh, distributions does it follow? If discrete, what distributions does it follow? That's the next level of question. And finally, the, what are the parameters of the distribution? So different probability distributions have certain parameters like the uh, normal distribution has two parameters, which I'm sure you know, the mean and the variance parameter or the standard deviation parameter. So even if I pretend that the data I have got are actually realizations of the random variables, I will have to answer these questions about, okay, fine, so uh, X, S, H is a random variable, but what distribution does it follow? Is it a continuous distribution or is it a discrete distribution? Is it Gaussian or is it gamma? Is it uh, like, and what are the uh, mean and the, like if it is Gaussian, then what are the mean and uh, sigma, mu and sigma values of the Gaussian distribution? These are all questions that we will have to answer after this. So for this, we have this elaborate technique known as parameter estimation. So from the next, uh, next two uh, weeks or so, uh, so I mean, uh, sorry, not two weeks, maybe next two lectures, we will brush up these concepts related to uh, probabilistic modeling, uh, parameter estimation and so on. And uh, because that's going to be very important for the rest of our class. 
so with that i would like to stop here for today and as i already said that there is a google form which is shared with you please fill up the google form and submit it that will help me to design uh, or uh, to understand how much of the things we should be brushing up over the next 3 4 classes so 3 4 lecture hours okay so that's it for today because it's the first class i will i won't go the full time so let me stop it now